Good afternoon and welcome to this Climate Salad Lunch and Learn. How to be investment ready fireside chat with a growth impact investor from Dragonfly Capital, Adam Tucker. My name is Charlotte Connell. I look after the ecosystem here at Climate Salad. And before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land of which we meet. For me, that's the Gubby Gubby people, Wanya Nullum, and I pay my respects to the elders past and present and honour their continuous connection to country, land and sea and am definitely voting yes to a voice. Um, and I really look forward to enshrining Indigenous voice to our constitution. Adam, now today is going to be a fireside chat style event. So please, um, you know, put your, your chat or your questions in the chat here or come off mic and jump on in and ask Adam some questions, but I'm going to put you in the hot seat first, Adam. We had this discussion of a lot of consultants will tell you, you know, what investors are looking for and, you know, what to put in your pitch deck. But what about hearing from an actual investor what it is you look for? So first, before you get to that stage where you see a pitch deck, how do you like to be reached out to? Like how, how do potential companies get in touch with Dragonfly Capital? And, and what's your preferred way of getting in touch? Mm. Uh, I guess for, the first thing is we, we love hearing from companies. I think that's the most important. That's a really important thing I want to make a point of stating. First of all, because I think sometimes people, they hold off on reaching out to investors and, um, and fund managers, but they, they hold off too long. So, so we love we love hearing from people whether they're ready or not or they're suitable or not. We we love hearing from them. For us, um, the best way to reach out to us is actually send us an email. We have an email address that's written on our um, on our company webpage. I think it's hello at Dragonfly and Viro Capital. Um, so that's the best way to reach us. People reach out all sorts of other ways. Often they'll come to me directly. Um, they the worst one they do is come directly to me via LinkedIn. Uh, I don't manage my LinkedIn. And so I, I very rarely see that kind of thing. And um, and then probably once a month, I'll jump in there and comb through those messages. But the, yeah, the best way to get in touch with us is definitely an email to our, uh, our central email address. And we look at every single opportunity that comes into our business and we provide feedback to every single opportunity. That's, that's a, a, a point of... Um, our business, the, the point of the way that we do things because we believe in whether someone's ready for our investment now or in a year or two, we, we want to be uh, treating people respectfully and, and, um, and, and keeping, keeping the, the whole ecosystem collaborative and open as opposed to setting any boundaries. And I probably should have started with, um, can you give us a, a quick synopsis of Dragonfly Capital and your investment thesis? What really excites you in that space? Yeah, we, we, have, a, um, we have two funds. We have a growth focused fund, which is a, a private equity type of fund that invests growth capital. capital. Um, and that can, be, that, that can be in businesses that are quite early. Um, or businesses that have been around, one business in there has been there for 15 years um, and has been profitable, you know, makes several million dollars a year in profit, but they uh, needed capital to expand into the USA. Whereas there's another business in there that was only a year old. And it's all about growth money for us. They, they, our mandate for that fund has it that they need to have a very clear pathway to profitability if they're not already at break even. Um, and they they can't be pre revenue. They need to have a, a they need to be able to demonstrate that there's a product market fit. So we call that growth capital in our world, and and we um, we leave the really early stage VC to other funds like Giant Leap, who, uh, who's another really good impact focus, very early stage VC. Notwithstanding, we see we we've a number of deals we've done through the years where we've met someone and they were really really early stage for us. We said please stay in touch, and they came back a year later, and they were they were ready. So we always ask people to stay close to us. And then our other fund, which is probably a lot less relevant to this group, is an impact real estate fund where we're investing in to real estate that 
is out there making a difference in the world. And one of the examples of one of those assets is we we own the um, the building that Greenpeace is located in in Sydney here. So we bought that and provided them a ten year concessional lease so they could keep doing the great work that they do in the world. You talked a little bit there, Adam, about, um, you know, you need to see that profitability and that um, pathway to growth and success. What about the impact part? Um, Elisa from Alberts was, uh, did an online workshop yesterday and it sort of had those like the pillars of um, the social impact and the environment, environmental impact. What is it that, what do you look for in the impact space when you can see there's a definite and clear pathway to profitability? Yeah, so we're, we're, our primary focus for our growth fund, it, it's an open mandate in terms of the in terms of the impact, but we know we know climate and biodiversity and environment. We believe we know that well. We we tend to believe that we understand that impact sphere better than we understand the social impact of say the next um, mental wellbeing platform or something like that. Um, I definitely believe that it's all extremely important, but we stick to what we know and we definitely know climate, biodiversity and environment. So th that's sort of our impact focus. And of course, those will touch on multiple uh, UN SDGs, which is what we try and tie everything back to. And we use the, um, the impact project management framework to measure impact and and. Um, and continue to score it as we go along. Impact is really important to us. So it's actually our first screen. So a business, I'll probably jump past it. A business won't, we won't actually look at something unless it gets to our impact screen. And that's a five minute screen that our analysts will do when a deal comes in because we see about five or 10 deals a week. Um, and not all of those are, are in impactful in the way that we see impact. So we have to very quickly be able to comb through those and make a decision as to whether we will put more time into that. So, yeah, so our impact's primarily climate, if you will, and we um, we screen for that first and foremost. That's good. No, it's good to know with the impact. Um, but like the analysts do a screen, and I know Giant Leap has an impact calculator, so it's really good. Oh, and I encourage everyone to go check out that impact calculator. We are launching the Climate Tech Industry Report next week. And this is an area that is so inherently hard is those <laughs> impact measurements. You know, like um, you mentioned the impact management project or now IRIS, um, like they're still developing what the climate is. Um, and so there isn't this like global framework for, hey, this is climate impact and this is how, you know, the metrics you use for measurement. So like how important is that like when your analysts are going through like can, how, how do you view impact articulated is it through numbers yeah. is it through a theory of change like what for yeah. those on the call today like how will they best succinctly describe their impact is it through a theory of change like Jody from Kalara yeah. Capital tells us or what is it you you have to best describe it the best you can describe it <laughs> <laughs> as silly as that, that sounds, I, I get this question uh, very, very often um, from, you know, I had it from a journalist the other day, I get it from investors a lot. And the, the thing about impact, it's not always, I mean, we, we, we're prone as, we're prone to measure um, quantitative, quantitatively but not all impact is quantitative. It, a lot is qualitative. So how you convert something that's a theory of change or a quality-based type of thing into a quantity is a, a difficult question. You know, I, I was educated as an engineer, so my background in science, I can, you can give me one data set, I can tell you 10 different stories as well. So it's sort of like, how do you how do, you do that? But it's, I, I, all I can suggest to founders is, articulate what the impact means to you and and i would recommend aligning it with the un sdgs that's one thing that seems to have stayed consistent when people are talking about impact in, in this world of which we work um, it's it's up to the investor to decide on what 
they're looking for, you know, that different investors definitely like different things and you can't change that. Um, so focus on the impact that you're focusing on as an, as an organisation. Do not try and alter that to suit a specific person. I can see through BS all day long. This is what I do for a living. Um, so don't try and sell me something as climate focused when it's not. And it, I don't mind if it's not, by the way. Everyone is so welcome to go and do business and create and do what they do. That, that's wonderful. I love entrepreneurship in general. But, um, I, yeah, I just think talk, talk through it authentically as it means to you and try and draw it back to the UNSDGs if that's how you're trying to communicate it to investors. And out there, there's someone for everyone. And, you know, not, it's, it's like the matchmaking game, really. You know, them. Not everyone's going to be for everyone, but there will be someone for someone. So um, articulate your impact your way. Before I get into, because um, you did say the, the BS radar, before I get into red flags, you did say even when you're early stage, um, you know, and maybe not suitable for Dragonfly's fund just yet, you do like it when founders stay in contact with you. What are, what are some of the ways that you like that to happen? Yeah, we, we love it. Um, we, what we often, um, what can, can often occur when we look at something is we, we'll provide feedback and say, look, we'd like you to get to here, here and here, if, if we're particularly interested in something, or it'll just be, look, it's too early for our mandate, come back to us when you're at revenue or when you're here and here. So, you know, I mean, when organisations think they're there, they should just come and say, hey, we're here now, we want to talk with you. Um, but of course... The, the most common one is uh, we've, we successfully completed that last raise we talked with you and now we're ready at our next raising stage and we're raising for this reason. Um, so just, just let us know. Um, some, some companies, I think this is really cool. I don't get to read all of them, but I know that um, our analysts do. Some companies set up on one of the... I think it's called Cake Equity. That seems to be pretty cool. And it send, they, they just send these updates and they have a mailing list, which I think is really cool, you know, to see a few dot points along the way. Some are very good at that. And, in fact, um, I mean, I, I'm bad for doing it with our investors. I, I don't get around to it, and I should, you know, um, with people who we've asked to invest with us who may not have. But I actually think it really works because I see some of these companies coming along that way and, and it's just a very quick oh there's three dot points it's going well and then it's it's back on top of your mind so i think that's a really clever way to do it but i also think that it's a really clever um organizational management strategy in a way because if you're the founder and you're the operator it keeps you on on your toes remembering where you're at because we can just get so bogged down in the day-to-day -day when we're building a successful company that's really good tips. I know um, if anyone's joined one of uh, Mick, uh, our CEO's workshops on how to capital raise, he always talks about this, you know, make sure you get that ma mailing list and those updates of like what's, you know, wins, possible like setbacks um, and updates and just keep um, investors in, in the loop of, of your progress. And I guess that breeds a familiarity and you can, you know, yeah. be up to date. So yeah. Um, Adam, I dare say your inbox is going to be full with a lot of updates, you know, and yeah. it's always good to, I guess, start that before you're about to raise, but just to keep you in the loop. Um, what about, and I think Hank wanted to ask a question and Hank so kindly went through his um, pitch deck the other day, but, and definitely if anyone wants to have a pitch deck session and go live with Adam right now, but I wanted to ask you, Adam, what are some of the red flags? Like what are some of the sort of common mistakes and how to overcome them? Uh, in 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 pitching, do you mean, Charlotte? Yeah, in pitching and and, and pitch decks. Um, yeah. and, and and is it better to have a conversation with you or those email updates before you see a pitch deck? Or no. so yeah, I, I think that I think that's really probably dependent on whom you're dealing with. But um, the I I like we like to uh, get a deck and just have a read of it and run it through our screens before we meet with a founder because we, we, we're we really conscious of the way that we manage time in our team and also of the way that we um, 
the way that we monopolize the time of others. It's a really important part of our culture and we never want to have a sit down with someone unless we're truly interested. So uh, because we don't want to use it, waste their time or our team's time. So we, we like to receive a deck and we'll, we are, some, sometimes people say, look, can we have a call and, and I'll often say, can you speak with um, our analysts and please send a deck and then we'll let you know. And more, you know, more often than not, it ends up we have a call and we learn more anyhow. Um, one of the big red flags that, that there's a few turnoffs. So I think what one recommendation I make to organisations raising is remember that investors do this daily. You know, we look at <laughs> we look at deals every day, and this is what we do for a living. And if you're raising, you might raise once or twice in your life. Remember that we do that several times a month. And um, so it, it sort of don't come in and try and be, be full of BS and all salesy and think that you know so much more about than what you do, but just come in and represent you and your brand and your company authentically. I'm not very easily sold to. That, and that's probably just me. Probably, some people probably love being sold to, but I um, probably that's the country boy in me that I just have, I'm not a, I don't like BS too much. I'm sure I just get to the point with me. So if you come in and you do things like you greenwash and you and you say that you, you, all these things impactful and you're not, then immediately you just won't get a look in with us. Or if you come in with completely ridiculous valuations or ridiculous um, forecasts that have not been thought about, it just won't stand with us. And... So our organisation are quite scientific and numbers and data focused. So um, we really like to see rigour in forecasting and strategy. And I don't know if I, I don't know if every investor likes that, but we love in your deck to see that you've really thought about what your market is, how you're going to get there. Um, what your forecast would be for the next few years and how that correlates and, and is your valuation thought of or is it a thumb suck? And um, that's probably more because we sit in the growth capital area as opposed to the really early stage VC where there's a lot of guesswork. But um, those, so probably I've, I've gone on a tangent, but what I'm trying to say is the, the red flags for me are where people don't do that because I, I love an entrepreneur and I love a visionary dreamer, but I love, but they're no good to me if they can't execute. So if there's no proof that you're able to put rigor and sit down and really drive into stuff and that you just focus on shiny, then it, then it wouldn't be a suitable investment for me. But if you can show that you've got a great vision and you're a visionary, but you also support that with real rigor and hard work, and um, then I'm very excited by operators like that. So the visionary dreamer, but possibly with a co-founder who's very technical and, uh, you know, can execute. Or it can be one person who can do both. That's true. A unicorn. They exist. They exist. <laughs> they, exist. Uh, they do exist. And obviously, um, Hank, you have your hand up and please, um, you know, put your hand up or ask some questions of Adam. Um, yeah, this is your opportunity and fortune favours the bold, but not the BSs. <laughs> I hope I didn't seem too mean, mean or blunt there. I sort of hope we're just helpful more than anything. So. Uh, thank, thank you, Charlotte. And um, thank you, Adam. It was kind of the same question that Charlotte was just asking there about the, uh, I, I recently um, read a blurb talking about the visionary and the integrator and how visionary founders should try and partner with people who are natural integrators. So you've got one person who's more external and one person who's really crossing the T's and dotting the I's. Um, and uh, yeah, so I kind of just wanted to hear your thoughts on that or experiences on that, um, because I think many of us do hear different different angles. Some Some investors would say, look, uh, we only invest if there are two or sometimes three founders um, and others go, well, you know, if you've got the experience and you've got a track record of um, performance and business, uh, we're quite happy to to back the single founder business. Um, but yeah, we, I think I think probably most of us have probably heard similar things. You, you speak to one person and they say, you've got to have two and others say, no, don't go and get a tech founder if you can 
build it for a fraction of the cost um, by by outsourcing and paying someone. Yeah, I, I'm I'm not phased either way on the number of founders. Um, some people are simply brilliant. They can simply be visionaries whilst being an engineer, if you will, at the same, you know, a corporate engineer at the same time. Um, and, and that they exist. Uh, some people uh, can be incredible visionaries and terrible at execution, and they definitely should be looking for a partner. Um, the, the, the big thing that's hard in, in high growth businesses is managing capital. And um, if you're not strong with that, you need to go and find someone who's very strong with that and very strong at managing you, at managing that, because it, it, more often than not, the business, businesses fail um, because they run out of money or because the, the visionaries, a visionary without an understanding of capital or the finances will just burn it and they never... They're never on the mark. I used to do quite a bit of angel investing. I don't really do much anymore. Um, but and it, it really taught me that I just assumed every because numbers numbers are quite natural for me. Um, but I just assumed everyone was that way. And I learned a very hard way very early in my angel investing career <laughs> some years back that they're not. Because I, I and, and you know, there, there are investors out there who do early phase stuff who don't give a damn about someone's commercial capacity. They just look for amazing visionaries and it works for them but it just doesn't work in in our um, investment thesis for, for growth capital and I think that it's very reflective of somebody and their attitude to know to, that that self-awareness is is valuable for me as an example in our organization I'm not very good at managing our staff it's it's not I just don't like doing it so um very quickly, you know, when I took over Dragonfly, I put in a, a 2IC who's far more brilliant and patient and great and, at managing people and dealing with that than I. And he has a full run of the place and it makes my life so easy. Um, but I think it's a really important thing to, to sit down and take stock of where our own strengths and weaknesses are and go, all right, I might concede some of the equity in my business here, it might cost me a bit more to execute, but ultimately I'm going to end up with something in the end that's twice as wonderful. And um, so it's a, a large part of that could be personal awareness, which is hard amongst entrepreneurs too, because we're often crazy and it's great, you know, <laughs> but it's, it's a, it's a, I don't know. I, I don't, to me, anyway, long story short, I don't really mind whether it's one or 10 founders at, it's um it's really up to that group of people to really understand what they do and don't need and sit down and take stock personally. I think one of the other problems that I do see though is that they tend to go and get advice from some old burned out ex banker or something that couldn't really make it and and there's a lot of those kind of characters around that end up taking advantage of um, early phase business owners and. And they don't bring them much value. So I think you've got to be really wary about whom you choose if you are choosing people to join you on the journey. I can't get off mute. I was going to ask you, Adam, because you know, I, I'm hoping everyone on the call um, today will be sending you decks and you'll be sharing your email and they'll you'll be that. inundated. <laughs> um, but more so when you get to that stage and you get to those meetings, why would someone take capital from Dragonfly because that's something yeah uh, you know we have many uh, startups in the community at, you know at the scale up stage and then sometimes you know investor relations can go sour it's like you know yeah. they ask too much or you know how as well as money what is the benefit of of you know partnering with Dragonfly Capital? Oh uh, you'd probably have to ask our portfolio investments about that but um, look, I, I, I think we, we have a pretty strong team here and I'll, well, I'll start by probably putting it back on its head. One thing that I've learned is that everyone always says, oh, that actually a, a fellow said this the other day, is ask someone 
what's a good investor and a bad one and the good investor is the one that gives them money um which is a bit worrying in a way actually because it puts them in a position where they may end up in, in partnership with an investor who they don't get along with in the long run so um but sometimes you you, you cannot afford to knock back capital and um as a as an early phase business sometimes you might only have one investor who's prepared to invest it the great position to be in is when you've marketed it well to investors and you've got several investors who have got deep pockets and want to continue on the journey and work with you for the life of the company um why might why might they choose us other than capital i, I think we, we we really are in the growth capital space i think we're one of only a handful in the country that do it, that are strictly an impact investment organisation. Uh, in fact, I don't really know anyone else who does growth capital in impact the way that we do. Um, there's, a, there's a number of small VCs that are impact and there's plenty of VCs in general that are not focused on impact, but realise that this is a fantastic place to invest in because the climate companies of today will be the tech unicorns, I believe, of this decade. Um, we tend to be fairly hands-on and hands-off subject to what the investee wants. You know, some of our investees are kind of, like one's been around 15 years. It has a really well-established board, very strong management team. They don't really want to hear from us, um, and that's totally okay. Another, a couple of the other ones at the moment, we're doing projects for. Um, that it would cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars to do if they went and got a management consultant to do. They would just do as a part of their work with us because we believe that um, it will really help them with their direction and their strategy. So um, I think it's sort of, it's up to the investee what they're really looking for and to really articulate that. And then the investor would turn around and say, well, we cannot come up with that. And hopefully investors have got their hands on their heart and they're being authentic with what they're offering. So with an ask, when when an investor, uh, it's not an investor, when a founder has clearly articulated that they, the ask is not just for investment but for, you know, this support or those connections or this, that's always a good thing rather than just asking for money? I, I think so. I actually really like that. I think it, I often ask when if someone gets through our um, various screens and then they have a meeting with us and, or, and me, I often will ask them, you know, what, what are you looking for um, in an investor? What, what are you really looking for? Because it says a lot to me. And it also, um, not every deal is just a bag of cash. And it's particularly in sort of growth capital or private equity type transacting, deals uh, come in a whole range and of shapes and sizes. So we might... And if we can really understand that, we, can, we might be able to turn and say, oh, well, actually, why don't we have a smaller amount of capital now? We will put you under our wing and do the corporate, manage, corporate advisory stuff for you for a period of time and then we'll get you there, the, the next round or whatever. Well, sometimes it's just, here, yeah, it's two million bucks, go on your way sort of thing. But um, it's really, really helpful to understand that. And I think it's also really helpful when you start a relationship that you're, you're very clear on what you want out of that relationship anyway because sometimes people they might be trying to help but a founder might be like can you just leave me alone and you don't want to have that animosity there as well um so i think they say that the average american marriage is eight years and the average investor investee relationship is 10 so it's a longer relationship than marriage so we need to get it right gosh that is not good odds for american marriages um, <laughs> So um, I, I did want to open up the floor because, um, you know, who is actively raising or, um, and, and please, like while Adam's here, uh, Adam is incredibly generous with his advice and time. Um, so please do, do take advantage of asking questions or, you know, sharing opinions. Joanna. Um, thank you. Um, and thank you, Adam. Um, and I've, um, I have thrown a pitch deck your way and it's, I just want to say thank you for making it such a really lovely, inviting process. Um, a lot of them are, um, but, you know, just make you feel very um, uncomfortable, really. But it was a really nice process. And not that we've had a meeting or anything. I, I'm um, at the time before revenue, 
Um, so, and then it was a lovely email in return saying, look, lovely, lovely product, et cetera, et cetera, just outside our mandate. So it's just a really lovely experience. So thank you for that as a founder. Um, and then that leads to the second question being, um, what, what do you see as traction? So at what point, so we will stay in contact, um, but at what point, what, what does traction look like? Is it, is it uh, revenue? Is it number of customers? Do you drill yeah. right to the interactiveness of the customers, all that sort of thing? I think it's a, it's a great question, um, Joanna, because you're, you're, you guys are a tech platform, right? Yeah, sustainability. Yeah. I mean, when with, with early stage tech platforms, I think you cannot beat um, taking a cohort metric measurement approach. And um, so for you, traction isn't just about revenue. I think certainly number of users on platform on a month on month basis, return, retained users, new money in. Um, I think they're super duper value, like super duper valuable metrics to be, sorry, to be presenting to potential investors. There's a, and a good resource on that. I'm sure a lot of people read it. It's really boring book, but um, it's the, that lean startup book that talks probably just need to read the first few chapters and then use it as a, as a something to hold, it, you know, a doorstop. But the first few chapters talk a lot about cohort and, and how you can use that in tech. And I think it's a really, really excellent thing to present to your investors as well. We regularly will ask tech um, businesses who come to us uh, that are within mandate to go back and assemble that data. It's another thing that it will do is it will show to potential investors that you're um, that you're actually on top of it as well. Like it's sort of I'll often ask it just because it gives me a feel of where the organisation's at and does data really matter to them? Because I think to be data led is um, is a really great way to be successful in tech. You can spend so much money in tech on product. And no one might, in, might not even want it, you know. Yeah. So it's, I think cohort, um, using those metrics, that, that some of those metrics I mentioned, is really the key. And then key assumptions around what a customer's really want and how do you measure that and you just keep measuring on a monthly basis and look for those trends. Is there a, um, can you suggest a way to best present that uh, user engagement? Because um, we, we haven't actually put anything in the app yet. I'm just trying to be a really lean startup. Yeah. Um, is there something that you've seen that uh, other startups have used a lot and successfully without a lot of cost to measure those those um, metrics? Pretty hard, huh? Um, the the key to setting those metrics up is actually setting you're, you're making a key assumption as to what matters to your development and product and your organize and and your your operational organizational development. So, what is engagement? Is it how many times, it could be so many things, right? We, is it how many times someone logs in? Is it number of people on website? Is it new users? I, I sort of think that one of the key ones to present is new users on platform monthly and users retained and returned users because, um, the engagement one's really hard to measure, measure unless unless you've got technology in your tech that works. But what what's engagement? You know. Um, so I'd be more looking at I'd I'd be more measuring. Am I getting traction? Because that'll suggest if if products wanted in market, or if yeah. You, know, you got you also see trends where you might just do a little marketing pump on something. You might try spend a couple of grand, and then you'll see if it impacts that sort of stuff as well. But in, engagement or whatever is hard. And you've actually, you've got to sort of sit down trying to find yourself and then work out how you measure that. Hmm. All right, thank you. That's great. That might have been a fairly open-ended question. Uh, sorry, uh, response, which I apologise for, but it's, it's, it's sort of like a you, it's sort of like a find, pick your own path thing when putting together those metrics. Wrap it. Yeah, hi Adam. Um, sorry, this is a similar question, but it's probably some of the, or one that some other people in the room would be interested in the answer to. When you're talking about a hardware business in the climate tech space, what do you guys look at for traction in that front? Like, you know, when you've got a product that's sort of a pretty high barrier to entry from a manufacturing perspective. Yeah. Uh, how does a how does a hardware business prove traction before they've funded their manufacturing? 
It's a hard one, that one. Um, what what kind of product or hardware are you talking about? Just to give you a bit of a... Well, I mean, in our case, it's like a building automation system. So we're doing, we're sort of um, doing air quality and energy saving, we're sort of removing the barrier between those two items. Um, but I mean, it's probably relevant to anyone here that's doing hardware though. I mean, you know, pilots is one thing, I guess, patents, so on and so forth. I'm just wondering if there's any other traction metrics other than that that you would look at in the hardware space. Yeah, we we tend to um, if it's hard, we we don't we like um, dirty, good engineered stuff. <laughs> it's probably my background. So that it's funny. We'd be one of the few in uh, investors that doesn't just want to do B two B SaaS. So so we don't mind hardware, but you you're in a hard position because ultimately I we would look for pre sales on on product or letters of intent, because you can, you should have gotten to a stage where you've got prototype and you've gone and sold that in the market or gone and presented it to market. And, um, and letters of intent and pre-orders are just the clearest way to demonstrate a product market fit because there could well be no product market fit. Yeah, okay, interesting. Yeah, because we had, I had a chat with um, Alana, I think it was with you guys a while ago. Yeah. Um, anyway, I'll send you something offline because we've come a bit further since then. So that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Please feel free to send through anything. But yeah, that like in growth capital, maybe not so much in the early stage VC. We we need we want to see demonstrate a product market fit. But you can still use an MVP type lean model when you're doing hardware. You go and get a prototype and you go and sell it in the market. And if people like it, want to write letters of intent and and pre order then your proven product and you go and go and build them. Yeah, no, makes sense. Stephen, old school, actually waving your hand and not putting up an emoji hand. Go for it. Um, just a quick question on some of the UN SDGs. I was curious in your portfolio, which SDGs you're currently investing in? Uh, we're, we're pretty, actually our mandate, Stephen, has it that you just need to address one of them. But we tend to invest along thematics of things that we understand, like I was saying earlier. So we, we end up, it tends, it just always tends to fall back on um, things that, that deal, that attack climate and uh, biodiversity and general environment. So we, the fall, the fall you know, the, the great thing about SDGs is in addressing climate change, you might be addressing water quality and, and, um, and a bunch of others on the periphery as well. So, but we 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 don't have a we don't have specific ones. We just say that organisations need to seriously be addressing um, one of those. Yeah. Okay. So Steve, yeah, I, yeah, talk to us about your solution. Sure. A bit of background about myself. I'm actually in the cold of Melbourne, but I leave today back to Magnetic Island where I've got a robot that helps grow coral. The design is to be used at scale, um, automating the tedious manual labor in coral aquaculture. Now coral can be used for a lot of reasons. Uh, I'm really interested in putting coral in the ocean. And the reason I ask about the uh, SDGs is because in the growing and emerging industry of coral reef restoration, which is emerging as I meant, emphasize the the need is there but the global market space is trying to figure out exactly how to fund it so governments are putting forward speculations and you know we've got letters of support but there's no dollar per coral outplanted currently so some of these things are going to be driven by future markets yeah as well as the global social demand of wanting to get involved so we've got revenue people are engraving their names into a uh, a substrate which we're growing coral on. So there's something there, but we need, as uh, Rob has mentioned, investment into developing hardware capital. Hardware is hard and getting investment for it is, is notably hard as well as getting investment for a tropical island that people haven't been to. So there's this uh, interesting dilemma we face. It's a big need and it's a it's a good product with a patent, but we're just looking into who knows the ocean space and in particular the coral reef restoration space, which is very small, but growing and yeah. which investors get involved could be connecting us to other ocean focused and water focused hardware. It's um, the ocean stuff's 
well and truly overdue to be addressed. Um, yeah. I don't know how to make money out of it yet. <laughs> but I'm sure that if you set a marketplace up, then you might be the one of the pioneers. It will happen in time, right? I mean, it, who would have thought that we'd be farming using practices that have been around for a thousand years now and that's a, that's the better way to do it and it sequesters carbon and that's, you know, we'll, we'll get there. So I, I would stick it out, but... Um, also happy to yeah i'm also happy to come up to magnetic island for a pitch <laughs> especially during the winter yeah <laughs> yeah well i'll send you some information just so you can see it but it's yeah. an interesting dilemma we face as humans because for centuries we've been creating value taking from the environment um and now we have to find value putting back in the environment mm. <laughs> And the metrics of that are difficult. They're easier terrestrially with satellites and with the ability just to drive up to the plants or the trees you've planted. But coral and the ocean space is very difficult to track. It's a, mm. it's a whole other ecosystem entirely that we are, you know, not in. So trying to find those metrics is a, and putting a value on that is a really interesting problem. Yeah. I think there's a whole bunch of comments. I just looked down the bottom of the screen. Should, should we address those, Charlotte? Or, or? Oh, you know, it was me going in, like in case oh, okay. SDG 13, 14, but uh, and Chris had to jump off. Amazing questions. Oh, and people are like, what about your email address? Hello at Dragonfly yeah. Enviro Capital. Dot com, um, yeah. But yeah, that's interesting because I'll be heading up to a magnetic island in September. So I'll come and say hi, Stephen. Um, and I'm sure, yeah old mate Adam who likes to spend his winters in Indonesia um, <laughs> away from the <laughs> old winter in Sydney um, will definitely be heading up there. Um, Sh Shania or no, Renate, would you have a question? This is a super simple question um, and it's it's a really basic question. Hi, Adam, I'm Renate. I'm a founder of Brownie. Um, we're at the very start of our journey. We're building an MVP now. We have a bunch of LOIs out like you, like you addressed before. Um, about to start our very first raise and just very basic simple question in a pitch deck you're looking for like high level what is the problem that you're trying to solve why your organization is the best place to solve it what traction you've got how you're going to conquer the marketplace that's it keep it short and sweet and keep a lot of time left for questions from investors or should you should you go in and drive the conversation anticipating questions like what is the best advice for someone literally starting um, the very first time mm. I think really simple, find, really yeah, simple. Yeah, yeah. No, um, I, I think the point of the pitch deck in a way is to get in front of the investor to pitch. <laughs> so it's kind of got to be, do, do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. no one ever read the deck and put money in. The next thing was to meet you. And so work. it's to inspire interest and intrigue. So leave it a little bit vague and ambiguous. So you want to ask more questions or tell everything that you need. So you, you can like have deep questions. Like what's the right balance? Because it's early days in your organization, there's probably not that inf much information that there would be if a company had been around for five or six years. So yep. you probably could put plenty of, you know, put as much as you can in there. I, I you know, there's nothing wrong with following a traditional pitch deck recipe. I think you should when it's really early like your one. Yeah. But if there's some special things, you should share that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just trying to think some, I'm, I'm lucky because I have a team of people here where if it's something's vague, it's, I just pass it to them and they go and get the information. But a part of you, the, Investors are busy and and like you and they're getting pitched all the time. So it's how do you set yourself ahead of how do how do you make their life easy so they under, understand clearly what you're doing? Yeah. And and more, more often than not, they're gonna say, How can I make money out of it? Because that's their job. Um and so you kind of gotta articulate what's in it for them in there whilst you're talking about what you're doing and try and get that first meeting and then then it's the whole matchmaking process really so yep. yeah so i mean I, I like a bit i like details so um uh so i don't see a problem putting plenty of detail into it mm -hmm. you, you don't want to have fluff in there 
I like really direct to the point sort of scientific cons, but you can get detail in like that. But that's me, you know. I, I'm not sure what others like. I mean, just trying to think, it, like if it's someone that's a single angel investor who might be, by the sounds of where you're at, might be someone like that rather than a fund, they don't have a team there to, to go and sort out extra information. So you kind of got to capture their, their heart and mind very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and that means your information needs to be really clear and concise and, 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 and enough of it. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Cool. Super helpful. Thank you. Okay. We probably have time for two more quick questions. Um, but definitely, um, I think, you know, there's, there's a difference between a pitch deck that's that you present in person and one that isn't for, for someone talking to it. So you probably do need to include the detail if you're not um, there to present it to them. So let me have a look. Oh, Adam, another Adam, he, oh, Adam, do you want to come off mic and ask? Sure, sorry. Uh, apologies for joining late. I've um, already been here for the last 20 minutes. Um, I just wanted to get an idea of Dragonfly's typical check size, preferred stage. You might have already covered this earlier, in which case just tell me to watch the recording. <laughs> no, that's all right. I'll tell you anyway. You can find out most investment firms, including us, provide information on their mandates on their websites. So I'd encourage you if you're um, sourcing investors to get out there and find out what they're investing in and they'll publish that for good reason, so you know. Um, our, we'll put $3 million in, um, in our growth fund um, for a growth deal. If there's a buyout deal in, we'll go up to $10 mil in cash and probably another 10 in debt. Um, but I think for everyone on this call, probably more growth type stuff. So yeah, three mil would be the max. Yeah, and, and what's the um, funds kind of timeline at the moment? Like how how many years into your funds are you? The growth funds only been around since September, so that that fund's got heaps of time where it's flowing yeah. capital, and the the all all fund managers are opening up new funds. So that once we deploy a fund. And we're not raising any more money. We're going to open the next one and start executing yeah. on that fund. So, if some, if there's an investment, if there's a fund manager like us, then they're always going to have money to, more than likely, going to have money to deploy because that's our business. Cool. Thanks, man. Any other burning questions? No, I think everyone's just like uh, grabbing that email to send you some decks uh, with um, good right. detail and numbers. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, you have a little bit more time back in your lunch break. And um, and Adam, thank you so much. Stay warm in, in <laughs> Sydney. Yeah. Sydney. Um, yeah. and, uh, and I hope everyone, if you are in Sydney next week, we do have the um, industry report launch at Stone and Chalk's new location, uh, Tech Central on Tuesday night. So please grab yourself um, a member's discount ticket. It's, I think it's a ticket, yeah, <laughs> I should know. Uh, but it would be great to see you all there. Um, and thank you so much, Adam. Thanks for letting us dive into your brain and, and pick it a little bit. So, um, and just finally, is it true? Do you invest in founders and not the idea or not the business? It's more about that. <laughs> Both, We're, yeah, I mean, there, there, there needs to be both there, but certainly the, the, the person matters very, very highly, actually. Um, it could be the best idea in the world, but if the person's arrogant or <laughs> not, not nice or whatever, then that, that we obviously couldn't, we couldn't marry them for 10 years. That's the, uh, that's the thing. <laughs> Um, or even Aiden a little bit. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Adam. Um, I'm sure you'll all join me in thanking Adam as well and get your emails and decks to Adam so that he can, you know, give you some really good feedback. And Joanna, that was really great feedback for Adam too. Um, so often I hear, you know, terrible stories about investors, but it's really good to hear that your, your feedback um, and your no is really considered and respectful. So... Yeah, yeah, thanks so much for that. I really appreciate that. So I'm going to pass that on to the team. That'll be absolutely delighted to hear that because it does matter to everyone in our organization um we most of us have come out of business ourselves, um and we were we've built our own companies so 
we um, we do care and we understand and um, we definitely want to be a, an example in the industry as opposed to an example of not how to be. <laughs> Really good to hear. Um, I, I have heard some VCs like send a feedback form straight away. Like, how did I go? I'm like, it's still still really awkward. Like, um, good, I guess. Once I get the capital, or <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's great to have that unsolicited feedback. Um, thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your days, and enjoy the shortest day of the year, which I think is tomorrow or the next day. And the days will start getting longer again. Um, and hopefully, see you on Tuesday in Sydney. Bye, everyone. Thank you. See you.